Well, it got big headlines in the Science Times. It said, NBL scientists discover secret of axon transport. And uh, uh, that was the end of me at NBL because NIH was so upset that the NBL was getting credit for this discovery. I mean, this was a fairly good discovery, and they were getting credit for it. And uh, uh, so they called me back. Said you're finished. You're finished at MBL. And uh, uh, so I said. And at that time, I got was offered a. I'm not going to say give specific. I was offered a Hughes position, which is a fully supported position at a, at a major, maybe the major university, and uh, or as major as you could want. And uh, uh, so I told them I should. I think I'll just. Why, why, why would I come back under these circumstances? And so they said, well, if you don't come back, all your people are going to get fired. They put, it was hardball. And I, I thought about it. I said, I don't know if I really don't, I really not, don't want to come back anyway, because I love NIH. And so I, thought, I went down and I talked to the director. And I said, look, I'll come back. But I, have to have a, I have to have an assurance from you. You will support me in a lab at MBL as long as I'm working, no matter what, for, for whatever reason. He said, you're on. So I had, a, I had a lifetime pledge of a lab here. And, uh, which, you know, that's not necessarily good for a lifetime, but it, it, right for a while they were going to support a lab here. And so I did some more work with Exxon Transport. But if I told you, I'd get bored. I've done a lot of little things. I've, I've worked out how the bacterial flagellar motor works. It's an odd thing, but I just got intrigued with it. And anyway, and we, we've, we, we really made some big, big steps on that one. And uh, I figured out how viruses get into cells. You know, they made some big steps on that. I'm you know, just fooling around with stuff. But then I got to thinking I want to get back to synapses. And we know very little about how the postsynaptic side works. How the side that receives the stuff that comes out of the vesicles, how does that work? And uh, people just thought, well, it's a receptor. It just sits there. And uh, we quickly discover it doesn't just sit there. It's a very dynamic, very complex, much more complex. And because of uh, uh, my work and others in the field, now we know more about the postsynaptic side we do about the presynaptic side, and uh, mainly came to teach in the course, and, and I had a lot of collaborations and ideas. This place is a marvelous incubator for ideas, and and uh, uh, somehow being here, you it, it, it frees up your creativity in a funny way, and. You start getting very curious about how things work, and and uh, get ideas. I'd like to look into that, and uh, um, and so I did a lot of that, and I met people here I wanted to look into things with, and so uh, I was coming here and having these wonderful collaborations with people, and uh, uh, teaching in the course, and uh, we get reviewed at NIH. It's like it's like a grant. They come by, and they, and so. At some point, they said, you know, Tom doesn't need to go to MBL anymore work on SQUID because the SQUID projects run its course. I had a graduate student, Joe DeVorges, who uh, made a beautiful transcriptome for, a squid, for the SQUID. It's been very, we supported that, and it's been very important for a lot of people to have it because we still don't have the genome, but we have the transcriptome that Joe's made available. And uh, we did some. Uh, Projects, some axon transport projects with Joe add pieces to that story. But that was really the end of the Kinesin thing, and the, the, the reviewers recognized it, and they said, oh, we don't have the same reason that Reese has to go to Woods Hole. And so we had this meeting with, I had this meeting, they would have a private meeting with us. I said, I need to go to Woods Hole. Uh, it's where I, it's my life, it's where I get my ideas. It keeps me going, and they said, okay. Uh, you can go. And uh, 
I didn't I didn't bring up they said I could go because that would be foolish. I just said, you know, I, I, I need to go. And they said, you, you, you can go. And so there hasn't been an issue with them since then. And uh, I could continue. I've been teaching the course for neurobiology course, giving us exactly the same lecture for, I think, 38 years now. And uh, not exactly the same. In fact, I had in my lecture one time, I had a student. And it turned out uh, it was a, he was a student in the course. And it turned out his dad had taken the course. He's like, I got my notes. My dad took the course. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's been one of the courses, has been wonderful. It's been the centerpiece of my life in a lot of ways. And uh, I've been very grateful. I had, to, I had to fight tooth and nail to hold on to my space in the their building, but I did. And I have it. And I have a little lab down over there that I inhabit in the summers. And, uh, I worked kind of too hard uh, on the, in my science, and uh, I lost a couple of wives. Well, one, one of them died, but uh, I didn't have a very good personal life in that sense of sort of satisfying family life I see people having. And uh, it turned out, that my, like, you know, I didn't see my kids much, but when they, as, as adults, I've become really good friends. And, I see them a lot, and so that's that part's been good. But uh, you have to you, you sacrifice things when you work this hard. And uh, but about thirty some years ago, I met this wonderful woman, and uh, we lived together for twenty twenty two years before we decided to get married. And she's a scientist, and maybe because of that or because it's just the right person, we're the right people for each other, we've had a wonderful time and there's no problem about working too hard or whatever. And so she comes over. She's a, she's a, uh, uh, works at NIH too in another department. So she comes over one day and she says, Tom, uh, you have all these wonderful skills in electron microscopy, why don't you? And he, she was interested in evolution. She said, why don't we work on evolution together? And, and then I said, all right. Uh, what are we going to do? And she said, let's work on sponges. And so I started doing EM on sponges. We got some sponges from Woods Hole. It always comes back to Woods Hole. And uh, I said, these are horrible animals. I, you can, if you, they've got these wonderful larvae that do all this stuff, crawl around, do all this stuff. But the adults are total loss. They just sit there and they have big blobs of stuff with spikes in that ruin your diamond knives. You try to cut the sections, you can, you can ruin a four thousand dollar knife with these things, and uh, I've had it with sponges. But then she found in her sponge tank, uh, she, she found these little blobby things, about a millimeter in diameter, crawling around. And uh, I said, "What well, pieces of slot?" She said, "No." And so she went to the library and she came back with this paper called "My Favorite Animal," and it was a little little animal called a, a trichoplax. And the trichoplax, it turns out, is is one of the so-called basal metazoans. That is, if you look at the genome, uh, they branched off from the very first metazoans. Uh, so the, the trichoplax and the tenophores and the sponges and the uh, cnidarians are the four basic non uh, 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 uh metazoan groups, and there's an argument about which came first, but one can make an argument for trichoplax. Now, the trouble with trichoplax is nobody knew anything about it. Zip. There have been a couple of micrographs, and the reason they didn't know anything about it was if you try to fix them with chemical fixatives, they fall apart. They just they explode. And I think I know why now. It's going to be an interesting story, but we haven't gotten quite there yet, but they do explode. And the old pictures that they had at the time were terrible. You could, and they, they didn't know how many cell types there were. So I, I said, let's, let's freeze them. Let's, do, let's freeze substitute them. Now, we had a new freezing technique that I introduced to the lab called high-pressure freezing. I didn't invent it, but I got it and got it working a long time ago. And so we high-pressure froze them and, and freeze substituted them. And they're beautiful. They're beautiful little animals. 
They were about a millimeter in diameter. We, so Carol and I were able to figure out how many cell types there were and, and describe each of the cell types. And we counted them. We, we gave a, a, we had a sort of a, a, a traditional uh, body plan of this of this animal and the reviewer. We sent it to Correct Biology and the reviewer came back and said, this is the first time I've ever seen anybody define a whole phylum. Because uh, we had the, we had the whole file in our hands, and so uh, I've gotten totally nutty about this animal for about four years now. I can't think of anything else. But I, I wake up in the morning and I think of trickle fox, and or if I wake up in the morning with my wife, we start talking about trickle fox, and uh, we've, we're working out one by one different cell types, I mean, exactly how they do it. And it turns out that the trichoplax uh, has some really interesting complex behaviors. They hunt and, and, and catch uh, uh, algae. Algae can jump and they catch them. And uh, so they, they hunt around and they catch algae. And yet our work on it showed they have no synapses and no gap, no electrical synapses, no electrical synapses. No chemical synapses. So how do they do it? This is the origin. Of, this is how the nervous system started. The nervous system didn't start with synapses. The synapse is an extremely complex structure. I can tell you that. And uh, uh, they don't. You don't start just suddenly with synapses. The animals have synapses. They have a long time to develop synapses. The question is. Where did the idea come from of cells communicating with each other and making logic diagrams that could decide what to do things, to hunt, hunt for food? And, and here we had it in our hands, so we have a way of discovering this. And so where we are with that is, is, uh, is that we've discovered that they have a series of gland cells that contain peptides. And we've now worked out... Uh, uh, the two of the peptides are able to release uh, uh, behavioral patterns. One of them releases the behavioral pattern that's involved with catching a, actually stopping over and catching a, a uh, uh, algae. It's how they, it's it's a feeding race thing, and so I think the nervous system. I think we're going to find the nervous system started with uh, 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 simply having compounds peptides and other transmitters in cells that secreted and diffused around. And uh, uh, that, that it seems like you couldn't quite get a pattern response out of that. And so I, I think there's another, another step in this mystery. Somehow, in some way, whether it could be mechanical coupling or, or some sort of chemical coupling we don't know about yet, that, that these cells are going to be uh, uh, the, the, these, these peptides are going to be releasing patterns, and we want to find out what they are. Because so I'm totally, totally fascinated with that now, and I think we may discover some things. We are already discovering things. They're going to be. You see, we think we know everything about the human nervous system. All, to know everything about, all we got to do is trace the synapses. There's this big human, the human, these big projects now. The the uh, a connectivity project where they're going to trace all the synapses and figure out how the brain works. I don't think they're going to get that. Synapses may be a big part of the story, but there must be there's must there must be communication going on. It was there in trichoplax. You don't you don't have a system like that that can hunt and throw it away. You build on it, and so it's deeply embedded in our brain somewhere. This probably is still this stuff, and we we're going to. We, if we learn about trichoplax, we're going to be able to discover it in, in brains in general. So that's my program right now. And well, I think the uh, evolution depends on change, you know. You, if you build a gene that couldn't change, you wouldn't ever have any evolution. And Institutions tend to build systems that don't change very much, and I think one of the things about MBL is the way it's changed, built in. 
Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, people come and go. They come for the summer, and next summer is a new a new game. Uh, uh, second of all, I don't have an entrenched bureaucracy here that insists on doing it in certain ways. Things change, and they very important is the fact that myself excluded for some reason. The courses kick people out after five years, and and reform. So the courses are dear. Every five years, we're going to change. Now every five years, the courses change over completely, and the and this building. You know, I've I found working here that the that you what you want to do is you want to listen to the twenty five year olds and the thirty year olds coming in, and and think find out what they're interested in, what they're thinking about because that. That's the future. That's where things are going. And the MBL seems to sort of uniquely set up to, with their course systems and the way they treat people. You, you come to MBL and uh, you don't expect to, your hair professor somewhere. You, you don't want to treat you with any respect. You get equally disrespected by everybody at MBL. And I, I think it's very important. Uh, uh, a student gets a feeling that they're Ideas are important, and they want to be, people want to hear them, and, and uh, that's what we do in our courses. We empower we empower people to have ideas and, and follow them up. We also show people how to. We don't give people projects and say this is your project. Uh, we empower them to think about doing stuff, to have ideas, and, and then we show them how to. We show them techniques they need to follow their ideas. We don't show them the technique and say now do something with it. They have to they they have to have the idea first and really want that technique and then they they absorb it like a piece of filter paper it goes right in and so they go back to the universities thinking well yeah it's not such a big deal to do electron microscopy and they, there's an EM facility here I'll go down and talk to them and ask them you know they know what to ask they know how to think about the project and that's one of the best things about MBL. Uh, is the way they and they empower people to have ideas and do things, and uh, they, in the course of that, they empower the faculty, and the, the faculty keeps changing, and every summer is a new deal. We had a guy named Denk teaching in the course, and and he uh, uh, from Germany, and he. Uh, we're, we're talking one day, and he says, and he says, Tom, he said, you, you got you talk about serial sections, and 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 uh, but the serial sections are really hard to do, aren't they? And I said, yeah, they're very hard to do, and and you maybe getting a hundred would be a big deal. I said, that'd be a very big deal. And he said, what? Well, what if instead of collecting the sections, what if you uh, uh, image the block face? In other words, image the thing that gets left behind. And, and then you wouldn't have to bother aligning the sections. You could just keep shooting away, and you'd, you that way you'd get hundreds, and you wouldn't have to worry about mounting them or preserving or anything. And I, I said, well, actually, there's a guy here named Alan Kazarian who uh, built a machine sheet and tried to do that, and I, I helped him a little bit. I, I, I said, you know, it didn't work, and it, 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 it's just not a, you don't when you bounce the electrons off the specimen, you don't get enough signal see much of anything and and Dank was a physicist he said well if you if you use a different type of electron gun with a lot more power you probably could get a signal and they said I want to go back to Germany and uh, build it build this build these things and so he did and that's that's the big thing in the field now it's a block face section technique that everybody wants to do well let's see uh there's a woman here whose name I won't mention who is uh, tenure or tenure track at NIH, I'm not sure which at this point, and very, very good. She's gotten a lot of awards, and, uh, and because of that, she's probably been offered a Hughes position somewhere, and so she said, tell me what should I do? Should I stay at NIH or should I take a Hughes position? And uh, I said, well, I can't answer that for you. But she said, why are you at NIH? And I said, well, uh, I'm at NIH because I can come to MBL. 
If I couldn't come to NBL, I'd stagnate. I'd, be, I'd go around in circles doing the same thing over and over again. But because I can come here and interact with the broader neuroscience community and cell biology community, young people, students, uh, it, it's, it provides the thing that every scientist has got to have as part of their life. So I'm, I think you could, uh, uh, if you get, well, get, make a commitment to yourself to come here in the summers as part of being an NIH, I think you, you would get the same thing as, this, you, know, as this, you get at this university. Uh, so that's what it's done for me. I wouldn't be here. I couldn't be here. If I, I wouldn't be at NIH, if I couldn't be at NBL. And a, a nice story was that uh, uh, we had the students doing this work, and, uh, and John was working with a student named Shelley Saltpeter, whose mother was a famous neuroscientist at Cornell, and uh, she. Uh, uh, a little flighty, a little flighty at the time, and and, and she and John were, were laughing and going to the beach, and and so um, they started a free structure run with the on, on torpedo electric organ, but they never finished it, and they went off to the beach and came back, and I said, John, they, somebody left the machine on, uh, but the nitrogen's all gone. You know, you, 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 you freeze fracture, you freeze it, and fracture open and make a replica of it while it's frozen. And I said, it, it, it's not frozen anymore. And John said, well, let's try it anyway. So we made a replica of it, and, and, and they took it up, cleaned the replica. I cleaned all the replicas myself, and they took it up to the EM room and looked at it, and my God, because it had dried, the water had gone down and exposed the cytoplasm. See, when you use free structure, you only see membranes. But now we could see cytoplasm, we could see actin, we could see microtubules, we could see everything how it was organized. And uh, that, that's how uh, uh, John did that for the next 30 years. That's how uh, freeze etching was invented by that student mistake. And that, you know, you have mistakes, but if you're ready to learn, learn uh, you can learn from your mistakes. And so uh, Shelley went with John back to San Francisco for a couple of years, and they did some beautiful work. And that set John on his course.